Hello. Today, we are joined by Jennifer Miller from the Dysautonomia Support Network to chat about her patient journey with um, POTS, which stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. And um, we really appreciate having you here, Jennifer. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, and so I just wanted to ask if you could just take us through a bit of your patient story from um, when you first started having your symptoms to getting diagnosed to where you are now. Sure. Um, looking back now, I can see as a teenager, I exhibited symptoms. Um, I started fainting, a lot of gastrointestinal issues. I was chalked off as a dramatic child, you know, so nobody really took it seriously. Went through my, you know, early adulthood. Uh, after my second child, I think that triggered it full blown and um, took me over seven years to get a diagnosis, 18 different doctors. Um, in and out of the doctor's offices, test after test, they would say everything was fine. Chalked it up again to anxiety, which unfortunately happens to a lot of young women, including teenagers. Um, yeah, you know, I was a young mom, busy, busy working, you know, they just, they blew it off my symptoms. And at that time I was fainting, my heart was racing, my blood pressure was dropping. I had a lot of you know, uh, symptoms that really caused a uh, disturbance in my life. And the doctors didn't take me very seriously at all. So um, lots and lots of bills stacked up and eventually got to Cleveland Clinic where they attached me to or, or strapped me on to what's called a tilt table test. Mm -hmm. And they raised the body up at like a 70 percent degree and um and they were able to monitor my orthostatics that way and then after it was like six minutes I fainted and they gave me all the answers I needed wow so yeah it was quite a long journey and unfortunately for our community it usually does take between six and seven years for a diagnosis that's a really really long time to not know what you're struggling with it is. There's not a lot of doctors knowledgeable um, of dysautonomia. The one good thing that's come out of COVID is, I think we're at upwards of 70% of long COVID patients are now being diagnosed or qualified for a diagnosis of dysautonomia. Um, increased funding, you know, from NIH. So we're getting more awareness. We're getting more eyes on these types of patients. That is, I mean, it's unfortunate that more folks are getting diagnosed, but like you said, it's it's great that there's more awareness about the condition now. Right, right. And so did you know what POTS was before you got diagnosed? No, never. I have um, a lot of uh, glucose issues with my dysautonomia. And so I thought it was all just blood sugar but I would go to endocrinologist after endocrinologist and they would say your blood sugar is great. Your A1C is great. So when they mentioned POTS and they wanted to do a tilt table test, I was really confused because then I started reading about it, that it's, um, you know, POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And I never realized um, if it's being something positional you know, that would increase upon standing and not as much so, you know, if I'm sitting or lying down. Right. Although the name, I think the name is unfortunate because it does uh, focus just on, you know, positional and being tachycardic, you know, at the same time where it is all encompassing of the whole autonomic nervous system, you know, and can affect you while seated and lying down as well. Yeah. No, that, that makes complete sense. Um, for people who might be watching that aren't super familiar with POTS, could you just share a, a quick rundown of, of the condition? Sure. Um, well, POTS, it, like I said, it, it all dysautonomia conditions are uh, due to a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. So each type 
uh, you know, there's the orthostatic hypotension. That's where a patient upon standing, their blood pressure drops, um, usually with syncope or fainting, you know, involved. But there's probably about 30% of POTS patients that um, involve, or they also deal with fainting or syncope too. And if not syncope, pre-syncope. So all day long, um, as I'm upright, if I'm trying to, let's say, make a sandwich, something in the kitchen, I get to the pre-syncope portion of it. I start getting my ears, my hearing starts going. I start getting very, you know, narrow-minded um, or narrow vision mm -hmm. and constantly. So in my kitchen, I have a stool, you know, to sit on. At home, I have, you know, of course, furniture, you know, that I can take breaks when I'm out in public, I have to use a rollator uh, walker. So a walker with a seat mm -hmm. so that I have somewhere to sit. When I was first diagnosed, I was young mom, very um, reluctant to use any kind of mobility device. And so when I had problems, I was always sitting on the floor in Target or Kohl's, all these places and embarrassing my children. Uh, so as I you know, grew into my illness, I realized that, that my rollator is my independence, you know, for me to be out in public and to not um, be panicking, because there's a lot of panic and anxiety that comes with the uncertainty of how your body is going to behave. Um, you know, you could do the same things one day and have a whole different result the next day, you know, by doing the same thing all over again. And it's not like, just a good day or a bad day, it can change by, I mean, in 10 minutes, you know, if you're not keeping up with things. So it's a lot of increase, um, usually salt, because that, that way you're able to hold on to the fluids. A lot of POTS patients or dysautonomia patients are um, have hypovolemia, which is low blood volume. So it requires a lot of increase in fluids and salt, which will allow you to retain the fluids easier. Um, also electrolytes, you know, are very important to a POTS patient. Um, with POTS, there's a lot of temperature intolerance, uh, so cold and hot intolerance. Um, so as I'm sitting here right now, my body is cold. I have slippers on, but I have a ceiling fan blowing on me, you know, because I'm hot all up here. Um, what else is there? It, it, it's so encompassing from your head all the way to your toes, you know, from your digestive system, you know, dilation of pupils, your respiration. Um, yeah, it, it involves quite a bit. And for me, one of the most troubling is the glucose portion of it. Um, and it's non-diabetic, but I have hypoglycemia, you know, all day long where I'm having to keep food and um, like sugar cubes, different things near me so that I can um, counteract that symptom. Wow. That's, that's a lot. I, it sounds like just a, a very dizzying array of symptoms to be able to deal with. And like you yes. said, it's, it must be very scary and confusing and frustrating to not have that predictability of how your symptoms are going to change and not know if you're going to be able to go out or do things um yeah it, it, it sounds incredibly challenging um what would you very say challenging and to leave the home it requires a lot of planning you know yeah. to make sure you have a cooler bag with all your stuff and a, a neck fan and you know you have to have all these things and it's it it turns into such a um, it, it becomes discouraging to where a lot of times patients are better off. They feel that they're better off just staying at home, um, mm -hmm. you know, so that they don't have to go through those troubles or they don't have to burden someone else, which then socially isolates the patient even more, you know, putting them into um, more of a social anxiety type situation when they do leave the house um, yeah. and are around other people. Yeah. I know you mentioned that your your walker with the seat has been really helpful. Is there anything else that's like been helpful for you in, in managing your day-to-day? -day? Um the walk managing day-to-day today -to -day is medications. I take yeah. some. And there's no cure for dysautonomia. So it is just symptom management, you know, so medications to slow my heart rate. 
um, medication for anxiety. I've always been a little bit high strung, but this this illness has put it over the top, you know, with um, anxiety, panic. Um, a, a wonderful thing, my neurologist at Cleveland Clinic, he's added mental health professionals to his team. And so they're trained on the autonomic nervous system. And then they counsel us, you know, but if you just go to a counselor, they're they're great, but they don't understand the challenge of a chronic illness like this and the effects it has on a patient, you know, every single day. So that's been a wonderful addition um, added to my doctor's team. Yeah, that's amazing. Like you said, there's, I think the mental health impact of chronic illness is often understated. And so it's really great that they have that as part of the support system. Right. And part of the um, the mental health aspect of it is uh, the support that our my organization that I um, am associated with, Dysautonomia Support Network, offers through um, our Facebook communities, you know, so that they can interact with other patients. We have a community on inspire.com. And I also host monthly virtual support group meetings. And we get great turnouts. And the they're mostly young women, but we have many male patients also. But they usually leave happier than when they came in, you know, at the seven o'clock hour, because it's always comforting to interact with someone who understands and gets it. Yeah, no, your organization does so many incredible things. And how did you first get involved with the the patient community? Um, started back in a Facebook group back in, in probably 2012. And then I started hosting in-person meetings. So I would meet people on Facebook and I started in-person support group meetings and um, built a little following here in Ohio. Um, I've met probably over 200 patients just in Ohio. Wow. Um, many years back before we even got into COVID, when we stopped in-person meetings, uh, we even did what I called a POTS walk. Um, we didn't really walk very far, <laughs> but we all did. Oh, not a POTS walk. It was a POTS luck. That's what I called it. Um, oh, brain good... fog and some cognitive <laughs> issues are also involved. So sometimes I lose my train of thought, but it's um, it was a POTS luck. And so we had about a hundred people and their families come and everyone brought food and we met at a pavilion and um, that was, that was really cool. You know, so I just, I know how isolating it is and how alone a patient feels and how much they can thrive upon meeting others that are going through the same illness journey as them. It sounds amazing. The idea of a pot's luck is, is a really great one. And that's such a right. good name too. It, it was it was great. And now I've had these same friends for over 10 years, you know, and these wow. friends have, I've even visited, one moved away to South Carolina and I went down and visited her. Um, so it's kind of like you're, it's like finding your tribe, you know, it sounds cliche, but it really is. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. And then when did you get involved specifically with Dysautonomia Support Network? Okay, so um, so we started with the Facebook group, our founder, and then in 2016, we became a 5013C. And she left the organization a few years later, and I've stayed on as the administrator for the organization. So I oversee the day-to-day -day happenings, but we are governed by a board of directors. I see. Wow. Okay. And so what is like a day in your life work in your position? Well, depends on the day. I am the one that answers the phone uh, for Dysautonomia Support Network and answer the messages that we get private messaging. Um, usually I'm always up for jumping on a phone call with a patient, you know, because they are experiencing you know, a major life change uh, in something like a chronic illness not only affects you physically and mentally, but financially. Yeah. And that's a huge strain on a patient and their families, you know, and who's going to pick up that other part of it. Um, so that's why I try to make myself available, you know, at any time. 
Um, I oversee the Facebook groups. I take a look at, you know, what's all going on. Um, I do the book bookkeeping for the organization. Um, yeah, it's just every day seems to be a little different. Depends on what's thrown at you, you know, but it, it gives me a purpose, you know, where for the first, let's say, year and a half after I was diagnosed, I just sat here and became very depressed. You know, so I depression is also something that comes along with chronic illness, you know, but it's more in waves for me now, not a constant heavy burden. Yeah, I'm sure or I imagine that sort of finding a community and getting connected to other patients must have helped a lot. Yeah. Definitely. And now our latest ventures are um, into grant writing. Mm -hmm. um, the other girls and I, we have about 35 volunteers within our organization also. Wow. And um, so the other, there's a, a leadership team and we've been taking, you know, marketing classes and social media classes and anything that we can try to learn to um, be able to boost us out into the, you know, stratosphere because we can't do anything without funding, you know, so right. we're trying to, you know, advance our skills now of how we can keep this going. Yeah. Are there any plans for the organization for 2024 in particular? Um, yes, we have one speaking engagement um, that I just heard about. I'm not, I can't even recall where that is. Uh, we have one speaking engagement and I speak to another organization next week that's invited us for a speaking engagement there as well. You know, we did um, back in 2019, we put on a big conference in Rockville, Maryland, and I think there were 11 911 calls from the hotel that weekend of our patients all going down. Um, so it's probably not a good idea for our patient community to put on those kinds of events any longer. Um, so we've had to scale back a little bit with that. We were pushing ourselves a little too much there. Yeah. Well, I'm sure the yes. the virtual options are probably more like work better for this patient community, I imagine. Yes, they have. And in fact, I've even tried to start up um, in-person meetings again, and still there's such a reluctancy, you know, amongst the patient community to be around other patients or, or around other people. Yeah. You know, yeah. With, with COVID and the sicknesses that are out there now. Yeah, it's understandable. Well, um, I just have one last question to ask, which is, um, do you have any tips or advice for anyone out there who's been newly diagnosed with POTS? Newly diagnosed with POTS, go to our website, dysautonomiasupport.org. Oh, okay. It will it be is loaded. <laughs> great, great. It's loaded with resources. We have uh, education and awareness awareness team that worked for two years on creating these handbooks and handouts, um, which are amazing for guiding you through this, um, that and join support groups and interact with other patients. That's you really, really need that and um, seek mental health treatment. If that is something that you feel that could benefit you, there's no shame in that. That's your mental health has to be as strong as your physical health. Yeah, I think that's so important. There's so many, um, I, mean, I mean, there's a lot of like grief and anxiety and depression, like you mentioned, that comes with getting a diagnosis and, and really like changing the way that you think about your own life and your own self and um, right. you definitely need support to be able to process that. It changes what you thought your life was going to be. Yeah. You know, and they say about 25% of the, of the dysautonomia patients are completely disabled. Um, I think the number should be, could be even higher, you know, so I've been considered disabled for the last 14 years and um, really only go out of the house if I have someone with me. So this is when a service dog uh, also comes into play with a lot of patients. Um, finances, of course, hinder the ability to acquire a service dog, but those that have them, you know, show a huge benefit by having one with them. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about a service dog being an option, but that completely makes sense. Mm -hmm. They can alert for um, 
you know, a cardiac alert dog. And they can alert for your heart rate, your blood pressure, your blood sugar. Um, and even just one of the scariest parts is fainting in public. You know, so that's why I personally don't really go anywhere without someone in the store and the car, you know, somewhere that someone could assist me. But a service dog, you know, to know that there's someone looking over you is a relief for some patients. I can imagine. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time, Jennifer. It was so nice speaking with you. And I will definitely link to Sashinomia Support Network and all of your resources uh, in the description of this video. That would be great. Thank you very much. Of course. Pleasure talking to you.